Buonasera, ecco, possiamo cominciare. Uh, questa sera è la prima eh, della stagione, ricominciamo con gli Art Conversations, ossia le nostre chiacchierate con gli artisti in mostra. Questa sera siamo particolarmente felici di avere qui Latifa Ekshesh, scusate la pronuncia del cognome, poi ci aiuterà, eh, che conversa con Alessandro Rabottini. Eh, Latifa è in mostra a Palazzo Grassi con l'illusione della luce. Grazie. Approfitto per ricordarvi che la conversazione è in inglese, avete le cuffiette per la traduzione simultanea, grazie. Allora, buonasera a tutti, eh, grazie per essere venuti a questo appuntamento, a questa conversazione con uh, la TIFA. Um, So like I would start like speaking in English. And um, so first of all, I would like to thank the Francois Pinot uh, Foundation for inviting me to join Latifa in this conversation. I'm really, really happy to be here. And so I would like to, like, to thank uh, the foundation and the people involved into making this happening, and especially um, Martin Pesano and Christian Valsecchi for Uh, making it possible. Um, so I work as, my name is Alessandro Robotini, I, was, I work as curator. I worked for a number of years at the um, uh, Galleria d'Arte Moderna in Contemporanea in Bergamo, which is a public institution <coughs> in the city of Bergamo. And I've been lucky enough uh, to work Uh, with Latifa uh, at least twice as curator. Um, the first time was when we did together a beautiful solo exhibition that happened in Bergamo in 2011. It was um, um, a solo exhibition which was conceived by the Gamek in Bergamo in conjunction with the Fraction Pagnardel. And the second time it was at the GAM, the Galleria d'Arte Moderna in Turin on the occasion of a um, Um, a group exhibition. And so like, um, I must say that uh, Latifa is a very special artist. Is one of the artists that they, are, they have this capacity to really change your view upon reality, which is, I guess, what the great art should do, like show you something that you're supposed to know, that you're supposed to be familiar with, And instead, like giving you a completely new view upon things, a completely new understanding of things. Um, that's why, like for me, like both the times, it was really, really inspiring to work with you. So, like today, I'm particularly happy to have this chance to further explore some of the um, of the issues that your work rises. Um, so, I guess that, like the most of you, you have seen the. Uh, really beautiful exhibition that is now on view at Palazzo Grassi, so that you have seen the, um, um, the beautiful installation that Latifa made on this occasion. This is a work uh, from 2007. It was made the first time in 2007 when you had a show at the Tate Modern at level two. Am I wrong? The first time was in 2007, and it was in Le Magasin Grenoble first. Uh, so when I saw it at the level two, it was it not was the first time. time. It was the second time. So first mistake of the evening. I'm sure that like more will come after. Um, so this is a, a work that Latifa installed more than once. It's installed in like a, in. Uh, a numbers of public institutions in the world. Now you see that installation here in Venice, um, an installation in Los Angeles, in Barcelona, at the Macba. And I think it's a work that embodies a lot of issues that your work uh, arises. So the, to begin with, like to give you a little bit of background, I'm sure that like most of you like are familiar with this work, but this like uh, is an installation made with um, carbon paper. 
uh, which has been then diluted with alcohol that basically like melts the 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 ink and creates these like stains on the <coughs> on the floor. The title uh, of the work, which I don't dare to say in French, because I'm French is really poor, and so like it's um, it's basically like something in English. Each stencil is a revolution, which is a sentence that uh, Arafat said in the late '60s. If I'm not right, if I'm if I'm right, talking about the fact that in the late '60s the political climate was so hot, so it was so like a, there was so many things were happening that um, basically every message could generate a little or a big revolution. Um, and it's a work that I think um, says a lot of things about your work because it's a work made with a very common object uh, and with an economy of means, which I think there are two um, things that are very important in your work. So you often, if not every time, use very simple objects and you kind of either present them or manipulate them but in a very simple way. Um, <clears throat> and I think that this economy of gestures, of signs, of materials is very important because it's mostly, most of the time are the most common things, the most simple thing, the most humble things that they generate the most radical transformation. So before like to start talking about the work, I don't know if you want to say something about the, you know, the beginning of this work and the way that you have been working with the same like work many times representing it and um, because there are things that I would like to ask you but I would like to start talking with you instead of just like keep going because I could. Um, so if, I, if you would like to start talking about this work and then I would like to ask you a few things about this idea of uh, creating even a damage in the architecture through the dispersion of the ink. And, uh, <clears throat> my, my first interest when I, when I did this work in the beginning was uh, uh, I, I first found a carbon paper in a shop, in a papet papeterie, <laughs> papeteria, and um, I, I remember my childhood when I was a kid and when you use the carbon paper in school to reproduce the exercise of my teacher. And um, I, have, I had this very strong memory of the smell, of the smell of the paper when the exercise arrived. And, uh, so I had this memory and I had the material and I, I was wondering what I, can, what I can do with this paper to do something that could be related to um, the world or the idea of the civilization. So I, I keep this paper a long time, during a long time in my wall. It was just um, hang in my wall so I and I w watch it every day, thinking about what could I do. And, um, and I remember when I was um, starting um, to, to, studies, to study the um, Israelo-Palestinian conflict, because, okay, it's something else, but um, I didn't know so much about it. I saw only people around me that were very emotionally <laughs> involved or emotionally um, uh, talking about uh, this conflict and then I started to, to read dozens of books about that and, uh, and in one of these books of uh, Xavier Baron uh, about the Palestinian called the Les Palestiniens uh, there was just this um, little quotation of Yasser Arafat who said that uh, at this moment in the late 60s, uh, for each stencil you have, a, a revolution started. And then, suddenly, I remember my stencil, my carbon paper, hanging in my wall, and I thought, oh, this is actually, this potential, potential, potentiality <laughs> of, the, of the object that I want to activate. 
So then I started to collect many uh, political tracts of the late 60s of the students in Paris and um, a, a lot of things. And so I was with all these materials, all this archive uh, in my computer, in my photocopy, and all this book I, I found around. And then I felt that I had absolutely no message to, to give <laughs> in a work. Uh, I have no political message to deliver to the people. <laughs> And, uh, and that may be the, the only thing I can do with this material, the carbon paper, is just to activate only the process and to show, in a way, the emptiness of a message. And um, so it, it, it started like that and it ended like that, with no messages, just, um, just a process of... Um, just a process of um, um, duplication and no nothing to duplicate but so speaking about the political value of the work because you said like i had no political message to deliver and so like uh, this happens with many of your works they start from like a narrative or an image or a memory or uh, some literature or some quotation but then you transform these sources into something that is more like sort of universal. And it's like, for example, in this case, of course, the work starts from that quotation by Yasser Arafat, but it is not a work about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. What I find interesting is that many times you take a material and you turn it into something else, which is, for example, in this case, something that is in integral that is kind of damaged in a way that is kind of vandalized or that vandalizes the space and <clears throat> what is for example i think very important you do that often you create this image of something that is about to collapse that something that is about to uh, be destroyed or as if it was pictured in the moment of falling down um, I think that, for example, when I see, when I look at this work, I always think uh, this work is about the idea that things are in the air, that no matter if you destroy them, like, for example, an idea or a message uh, or a symbol, no matter if you try to destroy them, the more you actually diminish them, the more they become effective because they start infiltrating, like in this case, the architecture and they will leave either a temporary or permanent stain. And this, I think, is the real political message of your work. Like, uh, you can try and, and hide things. Um, like, for example, in other cases, you have worked, instead of with the stains on the floor, you have worked with uh, the powder that the charcoal leaves. Uh, when the charcoal falls down from the wall and then it like uh, it lies on the ground there's something that it should be cleaned um, I think that this is an important part of your work because we often find it this is what like for the for example Ben Wartage called the reminder something that is left and this something that is left is what we will always have to deal with that we cannot conceal from our politics, our history. Mm -hmm. So like, uh, do you think that this is like what makes your work political if you regard your work as political? Mm. Yeah, yes, it's exactly what, what it is political in my work, but um, but this, the way I act politically is not to produce a frontal message or a frontal meaning of something. The political um, uh, meaning I want to, the only one I can express is, um, it's maybe the tribute of a political possibility but not, 
not something effective. Uh, it's not something uh, um, useful. It's something useless. It's something obsolete always. Or it's uh, the ru ruin of something that could be big or construct. And uh, maybe it's more um, my um, heritage of Walter Benjamin, in a way, like of the, the, the ruin of the society, of the ruin of the history, and what, how we can deal with that, because it's, it's, a, it's a thing of my generation, because, or maybe it's because I grew up in France, so we, we, ha we have all this uh, strong uh, and heavy <laughs> Um, uh, memory in our back of uh, the French Revolution or also the, the 68 uh, demonstration of the students and um, we have all this heritage of how people can change history but in front of our eyes every day we have the feeling that uh, we don't know if it exactly happened or if it was so useful in a way. And um, when one of my first uh, work, uh, just before for his Stencilo Revolution, two years before, I did a, a video called um, um, 11 Mars 2005. And it's, um, it's a, a video when I shoot uh, after a demonstration in Paris. So it's a very simple uh, video. Um, you have um, a Parisian boulevard. It's empty. The people, the demonstrators are very far. And you can only hear a few um, scream. You see some red flag, some smoke also. And immediately after, um, uh, the people from the city, dressed in green and with a uh, green truck, they start to clean the boulevard during 20 minutes. So I only show the cleaning of the boulevard after the demonstration. And it was exactly this feeling of sadness, in a way, sadness or melancholia about things that just passed by and um, wasn't so effective. Because, for example, you said like uh, that your work has a lot to do with the idea of the ruins of something that um, in the past was glorious or it was a promise of uh, modernity or progress or emancipation, and then for some reason, for some reason, sort of crumbled, for some reason, kind of like collapsed. This, for example, is a work that really like deals with that idea because this is a work that again, it has to do with a material which is applied directly onto the architecture. Uh, and this real intimate relationship that you establish with the architecture is always also really important uh, in your work. Like you always work with the idea of the skin of the architecture. And here you see like uh, two examples. Um, so you basically took these measures, these are modules, that Le Corbusier developed in the 20s and that he used in the 50s to build um, the Unité d'Habitation in Marseille. So they refer to the position of the human body into the living spaces, into the architecture. And what you did was you used these, these, uh, these measurements these, um, and with the charcoal, you use the charcoal on the wall. But again, like we have these uh, elements of charcoal on the floor, which is also something that the viewer will kind of activate because they will walk on that and they will like just bring it in through the room until eventually during the, the duration of the, of the exhibition, they will even disappear. It's a little bit like the video of the demonstration. They will, wash, they will be washed away in a way. And this is, again, for example, a work that starts from a specific narrative, which is the narrative of Le Corbusier, modernity, this idea of the unité d'habitation as a promise of emancipation and equality. But then you turn it into like an image of kind of 
the end of their idea. <clears throat> on, on the end of the idea, I really experimented in my life because I grew up in a, in a building, like a, a social building in France, and we, we were in this experimentation of the standard <laughs> size of human living. And, um, and uh, when I was a kid, again, sorry for all this uh, nostalgia, <laughs> but when I was a kid, uh, I, I had to learn French. So when I heard that it was called plant, it's, it's plint, and I thought that it was written in the same way than plant, uh, complain, and I was wondering why we call that complain, because so I start to think about when I was younger about why this part of the um, architecture is called a complain. And, but really later I discovered that it was not written in the same way and it was different. But I, I had already that in mind. And, and uh, so <clears throat> when, when I start to, to understand about the standard size of Le Corbusier, I remember that I experimented, but also I remember how it was uh, difficult to live in a, in a space like that. My father, for example, was very tall, and I remember that he was able to touch the ceiling of the apartment. And when I was a kid, I thought that this kind of apartment are not, make, uh, for, not made for tall person like my father. And maybe when I will be older, I will be also able to touch the ceiling. So it's really uh, strange to live in a, in, a, in a place that you know that it's too small for you. <laughs> and it was the standard of the social habitation. And um, so when I, when I did that, it was in a way a question of exercise because I am not big as a modular because I am smaller, 10 centimeters smaller. And, uh, but I, I wanted to, to experiment it with my own body, how it is to, to, to work with these uh, levels. That's why I, I, I love to do this work myself, like all the work I like to, I like to make them myself. And uh, it's like an exercise of a student. I, I do a line and then I pass a charcoal, like a good student. <laughs> And, uh, and then I just uh, leave everything uh, in the floor and I, and I, and I finish that. And um, so here in this photo, especially, it's uh, one meter 83. It's supposed to be the standard size of a, of a, of a, ma of a male, of a man. And um, in the other photo, it was uh, 27. No, this is 43 centimeter is the size where you can sit. Uh, and it was really nice in the Swiss Institute because uh, it was the, uh, the same high, so you, can, you are able to sit also in the border of the window. And, uh, so you, mm. you would say that also this work is about the idea of standardization and modernity as a form of restriction. Yes and that the work is about also freedom as well, like mm -hmm. individuality in a way, yeah. like the, the possibility to limit individuality mm -hmm. to standardization, mm -hmm. which I also think that you said before, like I often do myself these works, which is also, I think, <clears throat> something that distinguishes your work is like its materiality. It's very material, very physical. The understanding of it, like you, you feel the materials, you feel, you feel what you use. And I think it's interesting because you're talking about like the individuality of the experience of your father confronting his own body with an abstract idea, which was the one of the architect. So we could also say that your work has to do with this idea of, okay, on the one hand, you have history and ideology and you have like theory, whatever is abstract. And on the other hand, like you have the way that the people, they live within these parameters, mm -hmm. with their own body, with their own stories. Um, 
And that's most probably why like your work end up being so physical, both in its formal, on a formal level, but also as an experience for the viewer. Mm -hmm. And um, these are, for example, other uh, works that you made with this idea of the architecture. Um, in this case, we have this more like um, kind of like childhood memory of a game when you build up like little buildings with these construction tools and then they collapse and they're like, uh, you, you, you were telling me that, for example, this work, um, it doesn't embody like a, such a specific narrative in relation to the architecture. It's more like uh, um, the idea of like uh, leaving these traces of some action that you did. So in this case, for example, we don't have like in the other one, like a reference to something so specific like Le Corbusier but more like the image of a child that is playing on the ground, building something, and that they crumble down. It, it's, uh, it's that. So when I installed the work, the first time it was in Tel Aviv, and the second time it was in, uh, in Krefeld. Um, and uh, so I installed the tower in the space, and then I wait for the right moment, <laughs> and I start to play, and when it falls down, I go and I play with another tower. And um, the first time I did it, it was in, in Tel Aviv. It was uh, my first exhibition there. And um, so the way I work when I go, when I do show at Vir in Tel Aviv, it, I always go there and I improvise a work. So we, we are always doing that. And uh, the next time it will be the same process. And. Uh, so when I discover Tel Aviv with all this um, Baos building and all this um, um, idea of the, uh, the progress, uh, the social progress in architecture, uh, it, was, it was also interesting how it was ended by the confrontation of the, um, the speed of the, of the city itself because they are building all the time, destroying building, destroying building. I'm speaking only about Tel Aviv, and um, so you you have this uh, yeah this progress of the um, uh, ur urbanism, and uh, so by regarding that I th I thought about this game, and then I had to find it in the city, and then I found it and I play with it, and the second time it was in Krefeld, it was in a in a museum of Krefeld, it's uh, two building. Um, uh, built by Miss Van der Rohe in the 20s. Uh, this one was House Esther's, and it was two buildings that was built for a family. And uh, uh, the Krefeld House was, uh, the Esther House was with a family with a younger kid. So you have in the building uh, uh, a space uh, for like a playground for kids. So it was something quite new because before you do not even consider like the space of a kid inside the house. And so it was interesting to, to replay it in that way. And the other, in, uh, the other details, it's um, the way Miss uh, um, Van der Rohe is building the wall with a brick. It's very similar to the, to the construction system of this little tower. So it was interesting for me to play again this idea of the uh, building on destruction, building of, on destruction and uh, a system that is not um, really functional all the time. Because the principle of this game is very simple, is the more you have a tower, you can make it grow up, but by making it grow up, you, fragi you fragilize the basis of the building. So, and when it's fragilized, you risk to destroy it. So I thought that it was a nice metaphor of the um, civilization or the urbanism in a way. Like uh, this, what, what you said about this sort of agreement that you have with the gallery in Tel Aviv, that you said like uh, every time that I made a show there, mm. I never brought existing works. Mm. Every time like I improvised. Mm. 
And when you were telling me the story yesterday, mm -hmm. I was we were discussing this um, uh, interesting bodies of works that in the late 60s, Robert Rauschenberg made with cardboard. So Robert Rauschenberg, like, <clears throat> And in the late 60s, he was already having a career as an artist. And he left New York and he went to Florida. And he wanted to see how, let me see if I can refresh my, my, my mind, my eyes. And so he started, like he said, like, I want to have the empty studio. And I want to start working with what I have um, in front of me. And so he made this like incredible, uh, that. Then you said to me, it's your favorite bodies of work of Robert Auschenberg that is simply made with cardboards. They're very simple, humble, but again, very potent uh, works. And again, it brings me back to this very specific part of your work, which is like the simplicity of the, of the methodologies or the materials that you use. Because for example, you were telling me, it, you work in the studio only with the paintings and the objects, but not with the installations. The installation, they always, you conceive them, you may try some of, you may test some of the, of the materials, but then they happen in the space. And I was joking because I was telling, like knowing that you travel as much as you can by train, instead of like booking flights, to me, like they said, like uh, this is also like a level of imp there is a level of improvisation in this because you may, you know, like wait until the last very few minutes to make a decision when to leave, and I think that this freedom again, like it, the freedom, I think it's a word that like we should always bear in mind when we talk about your work. It is a lot about freedom. Um, it there is also with this relationship that you have with uh, with the way to work get into a space and mm -hmm. improvise or like work fast with something. Sometimes even like covering huge spaces mm -hmm. with something very simple. Yeah, it's, um, I see that there is many students here, though, so please do not take me as an example. <laughs> I think that they should, you know, especially now that like, uh, we, we mm. always think about this idea of overproduction, and yes. instead, like art is the, something that mm. we should really be capable to do with nothing. Mm. So I, I, I really love when I can have like a maximum of time, and uh, even um, in my dream or in my ideal, <laughs> I, I think I could change all an exhibition two days before the opening. And I'm all, I, I know, and people with who I work know, that they, they've got to accept it. <laughs> and, uh, but, but I've, yeah, it's okay. So if it's a big institution, so one month before, or three weeks before, it's set in my mind. But I always have this uh, anxiety, <laughs> uh, this worriness, because I'm always in doubt of everything. So I always think that, Maybe it's now that, and maybe in just before I, I could change everything, and I, I would love to always think that I am free to do that. And, uh, and it's true that uh, uh, artists now, we are more and more professional, and, uh, and uh, I think we lost, in a way, this um, freshness, and uh, I try to, to resist. <laughs> Uh, I do not have a, yet a studio manager. I do not make uh, models of my show. Uh, I did it once on uh, a 3D uh, uh, a projection of the show, but it was, it was in the magazine because the space was really difficult. It was my first one. And I thought that it will be like really adult from my part to, <laughs> to do that in advance. But, uh, but I'm not comfortable with that. And uh, for the installation um, for each stencil or revolution, à chaque stencil in revolution, I did no test in my studio before. So I know only that it was supposed to work. <laughs> so I installed it directly in the wall. 
And maybe the first time I did it without any paper before, so now I know that I have to put a paper first and then to put the carbon paper on it. Because some of the wall are too fragile and it doesn't stick very well with the carbon paper. So, so after the second show, I know that I had to make a piece of paper before. And, um, uh, but what will happen if it doesn't work at all? And <laughs> so fortunately for the moment, everything was well and everything worked like it was in my mind, but, uh, but I, I do not make a test. I, I, I like to do um, direct action on objects or things. And if I, if I do everything in advance, I will feel that uh, it's not, um, it's not um, fresh or the feeling is not uh, enough direct for me. I think that, like you said, that is a sort of an act of resistance, which I think it is, because it, paradoxically you keep a, a, a much bigger control over the work, um, which I think is important, you know, like uh, to you. And I think it's like also this idea of I would like to be able to change it the minute before that the work is finished. Uh, it tells two things that are really important. One, the connection of the relationship that the work has with the idea of performativity. Even if you do not perform mm -hmm. directly into the space in front of the viewer, but the work always has, seems like looks as if it was the trace of something that happened in that space before. And also the idea of poetry, of like um, something that, I mean, Poetry has this form of intuition in a way. Like even if like then every word is so carefully chosen and edited as like the materials in your work they seem, but then we have the feeling that it's a form of intuition, at least like from romanticism until now we have this idea of poetry as a form of intuition, of illumination, I would say. Um, so do you think that like these two parts, even if they're not immediately presented in the space, are part of your practice, like performativity and the relationship to poetry? Mm. <clears throat> uh, yeah, performativity always, because I'm acting on object or on material, and the thing I presented to, 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 to the public is the traces of an action, most of the time. And, uh, and uh, I am interested in how um, somebody can look at the work and imagine how it was done. So it's like another level of lecture. Um, for example, here in Eratum, you have the installation, and then you have, as a public, you have to figure out how it was made. And uh, so if you see that, oh, it's uh, glasses, so first, th this is colors on the wall, in the floor. And, uh, and then you see closely that it's uh, broken glasses. And then you can start to see ornament and you can recognize that it's typical tea glasses. And uh, then you remember that the artist is from Morocco, so maybe it's have a link. And then you, 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 you have to think about how it was made. So you, you can see in the, in the in the wall, um, traces of impact of uh, the, the glasses that was uh, broke directly in the space. So then you have all the element to rebuild the story of the making of the installation. And this is a really interesting part of the lecture because you have all a missing part that you don't have directly, but you can rebuild. You have the gesture, you can have the sound, you can have the feeling. This uh, idea, I don't know if you even try to break a glass, but it's, uh, you, you can try if you want at your place. <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's really, um, um, you have like adrenaline to, to smash something, to break it, you have really to throw it very violent, violently. And, um, and as I am a very calm person, and uh, happy and calm. And it's, it's, uh, for me, it's always challen challenging when I, when I do it. And uh, so if people can have a little bit of this feeling, but only in their imagination, it's really 
it really worked for me. And in um, fact, like for example, the, the art critic Ben Bortwich, like he said, like uh, when you walk into this room, which is of course a silent room, then you have this dis disconnection between like the, the the noise that you could imagine um, were produced when the glasses were smashed, and the silence that you're experiencing now in this again in this landscape that is a landscape of ruins mm. in a way, and. This, I think, it's really one of your most important works uh, for many reasons. Um, you were said before, like, uh, when then somebody reads in the credit lines and the artist is from Morocco, you activate an immediate reading. Um, because, like, of course, like, I mean, these are traditional um, uh, objects, like, that they use for tea, that they belong to, uh, traditional culture. Um, but then like uh, you explained several times that the, like, these are like sort of cheap replicas. They're like very cheap objects that you can find anywhere, that you can buy anywhere for very little money. Um, and I think that it, this is one of, is a very like important like aspect of this work, which brings like to the, things that we have discussed many times, the relationship between like the reading of the work, your background, your personal history, and the understanding that other people, they can have of that history. Because you were born in Morocco, but then you were raised in uh, France. So like uh, your work also has to do with this, again, a form of disconnection mm -hmm. between what you you basically like you were born and raised in you were raised in France, so like I mean you were speaking French, you were um, absorbing French culture, and then you connected with uh, Moroccan culture during university, if I am not right, right? Like so, like uh, you actually learned later about your origins. So this is also like a work about mm -hmm. this idea of destroying and re-regenerating the past that you basically didn't have. Like yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember it was in my art school in Grenoble, I opened some books about uh, Moroccan ornament, and it was so fabulous. And when I, when I read this book, I, I thought that I never heard about that before, and I, did not, I wasn't raised in this high culture of, uh, of uh, ornament and uh, it's so uh, it's so beautiful and the only thing I, I I saw it was at some neighbor place it was polyester carpet so not re <laughs> the real one uh, this kind of glasses that it's uh, really badly print so if it looked nice huh? but if you see it closely it's really badly print you have like a it's really not expensive at all. And so it's not uh, the real engraved with gold and with really thin details. And uh, so all, all as an um, immigrant, um, uh, American people around me, it's, they, they were all surrounded by uh, artifact or ersatz of uh, Orientalism. And, um, it's something really different from some friend I met after that come from Lebanon, for example. When I came to their place, everything was so fantastic. You have like carpets made, made with silk and uh, engraved thing with gold, and it was like so fantastic. But it it wasn't really my background. And um, and uh, uh, this um, I forget my. No, we were speaking about like when you started learning ah, yes, about when I like start your, learning. your background. So I, st I started learn learning at that moment. But um, maybe the, 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 the important thing about how I was raised and everything is that when I arrived, I was almost four. Then I start to go to a school, to a French school, when I was uh, almost five years old. So I had to learn French, and I had to learn um, uh, French culture. So all the object around me was uh, strange. <laughs> and uh, 
So I arrived uh, in autumn, and um, just after that, there were um, there was um, the Christmas uh, uh, event, and um, you had this uh, man dressed in red with a long uh, white barb and somebody that you don't know, and you have to go in his uh, car to take a photo, and uh, and then they give you presents, and you have all this cake and this thing, and for me, all that was really strange. It was really, really, really strange. And uh, uh, we, we had uh, to be dressed for the school like a um, um, majorette, like a... <laughs> It was also strange. And I was a uh, foreigner, so I was the one dressed in white. I remember always this photograph when uh, all the girl was in red on me, I was in white. And uh, so all that was, it mean, I, I do not have like a nostalgia of that, but I, I, I wanted to just to think about uh, how, how all that strangeness had an impact of the way I have to see object on on things in general around me. So from my, from my um, life of Morocco, I remember nothing. So I've got to, to build all my memory from the thing I learned from, from my five-year-old. And so all this object I, I have to discover. And, and then, yeah, yeah, all this uh, strangeness ended in a in an uh, obsession of a uh, normal object around me. And <laughs> yeah. So like when, mm. when, you were, when you were studying as a student, as an artist, mm. it was in the 90s, right? And so at the time, the, the, the idea of identity-based works it was really strong. Like there was a lot of debate about works that were mm. developed, like with, um, portraying like either uh, sexual identity or for example, cultural identity. The, the idea of belonging to something was really big. While uh, basically like uh, your work seems to be the opposite, is about the non-belonging mm. to something because of course, for example, you're using like cheap replicas. They could be even made, be made in China maybe. Yeah. So it's not about like uh, something which is pure. Like for example, many times like we see um, the belonging to a culture as a form of belonging to something which is original, which is pure, which like um, is a form of origin. Mm -hmm. While you're basically reverting that idea, reversing that idea, you like are you are working kind of against it and showing that we don't even know where where to locate the idea of purity. I was really against that because uh, when I start to, to work with, um, um, in my third year of art school, there were all this um, attack of the subway in Paris by the uh, integrist. And <clears throat> suddenly I realized that I was uh, Moroccan. That's where I start to open book about Moroccan culture and things. And, uh, and I never thought about that. And, uh, because I was always very well integrated. I was only with French people around me, some Spanish, but only no, no, not too much. Uh, my best friends were not Arabic at all. So in my art school in Grenoble, uh, we were only two Arab uh, in a total of 200 students. And um, so I started to go to the neighborhood, uh, to the Arabic neighborhood, uh, to find some stuff, maybe to cook or to... But there I wasn't able to speak Arabic, so I felt rejected. <laughs> and uh, on the, in the other end, when I went to the bus with my bag, uh, people were looking at me because I was Arabic with a, with a backpack. So it's, it's, I was suspect. So I was suspect everywhere. And, uh, and uh, then I started to ask questions to myself, so I came to some of my teachers, and they say, oh, yes, of course, you have to see a, a fantastic exhibition called Les Magiciens de la Terre. So I, I took the book, and I saw the book, and, and then I said, yes, but I do not recognize uh, myself in this book. And uh, 
So I, I felt disturbed. I really felt disturbed. Fortunately, I felt disturbed because I, I cannot uh, play um, um, the simple immigrant because immigration is, is never simple. And in my special case, it's never simple. And we have, like, uh, later I met other artists that uh, have to immigrate when they were, like, around my age, and it's exactly the same point because uh, we, uh, I wasn't raised in my culture and I have to to, to figure out how how I can I can deal with that in a in a easy way but it, it it was never easy people say that around me that oh it's fantastic you have a double culture but I did not felt that that I have a double culture I felt that I have no Arabic culture or no French culture so I felt empty two time. <laughs> Are not full two times, so it it was it was frustrating. But but then after I I thought that it was just okay. And I when I finish with all my <laughs> question about all that, but then then after that I've got to to deal with people who think that <laughs> I come from Morocco and that they are very surprised because I speak very well French, or they are surprised because I do not speak uh, Arabic at all. And, um, and I am not connected to the Moroccan scene, and I, I, but, um, so now I live in Switzerland, so I, I feel a little more neutral, in a way. <laughs> so, I, but, uh, but, uh, but it, it's this complexity, so you always, uh, people always ask, from where are you talking from? And I, I cannot say that, I cannot say from where I'm talking from. I, I do not uh, feel um, uh, any idea of origin in my... But in mm. fact, I mean, for example, mm. all the cultural studies, they are concerned about this idea of, like, uh, what is the position of the speaker? Mm. You know, like, what is the position that allow you to say something? And <clears throat> this brings us back to the political value of the work. Because, for example, every time that I see this work, I always think about like something that you said in an interview when you said there is a relationship between sculpture and destruction because in order to give something, in this case like a cultural symbol, to give it a new meaning, you kind of have to destroy it and empty it. And then, like, uh, and then you can turn it into something else, which is in this case like a statement mm -hmm. about like the, the dangers of feeling a sense of belonging as well. Like, I mean, what can actually bring you in your life to keep protecting that sort of belonging instead of like uh, going with flows of transformations and uh, a more like unstable identity. And I think that like, there is also like important maybe to underline in this work, the formal relationship with um, uh, this very famous work of Richard Serra, uh, which is called Splashing, which he made, I believe, in the late 60s. And he, many of you may have seen it, and um, uh, also um, uh, it was like reenacted uh, in, I think, The Last Cream Master by Matthew Barney. I think he reenacted it as well. But anyway, like Richard Serra used the lead and he splashed it against the wall. And so like uh, the lid became solid and then like uh, now the piece exists as a trace of the architecture. So like basically, <coughs> sorry, he turned a liquid state of the lid into something solid, which you actually did the opposite. Mm -hmm. You took something which was entire, like the glasses and you destroy them. So again, like as you did with the, with the installation that we saw here at Palazzo Grassi, you took something which was as a whole, as something like uh, integral, and then you turned it into something that is like kind of, that is either collapsing or that is like uh, fading away. Uh, which, you did, for example, also with this um, very beautiful installation that you presented both at the Frac Champagne Ardenne um, and at the Gamec, which is called Stoning. So immediately 
one is confronted with, with a really tragic image. Um, and here again, we have this feeling that we often have with your work of an action, in this case, a murder that, is, that happened in that space and that is, we only are confronted with the traces. But you said before, I like to do things in the space by myself and to have this physical confrontation also with the materials. In this case, it seems that like a stoning happened, but actually, what are these? Like, they're not stones, they're bricks that come from a building in, uh, in um, uh, uh, REM, that you sculpted yourself so that they could look like stones. Would you say something about that? Because this is, uh, again, about destruction, giving new meaning to something, the relationship between sculpture and violence, and violence like against like women as well. So like a... So I always dream to be a classical sculptor. And uh, so it was a, a way to, to do that in that work. And so... <clears throat> um, this work was a little, it was a little bit difficult to assume because always I, when the most difficult thing is to assume a work. This work was a little difficult because it was about, um, I think I, thought, I saw things about stoning on TVs or the, in the news and, um, and I had this um, really strange question that I asked to myself, it, oh, I wonder how it how it is a landscape after a stoning, and then I felt so guilty about thinking of that because it's like a professional deformation, <laughs> like to think about a, a landscape after a stoning. It 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 was not uh, really nice thinking, and um, and then so I start to figure out how it could be, and um, and. Um, and then I thought, okay, it's it's easy because it's like if we put um, a little piece of dynamite in the middle of a um, uh, Richard Long uh, sculpture, and uh, so it's I thought, okay, it could be related to <laughs> to the history of art. It's it's fine. And then when I, I I start to look at stones around, so the first time I did it in Reims, and then after in in Bergamo. And in Reims, I was just looking around where I can find some stones. And there were this, uh, this uh, building in the middle of the city called uh, Les Halles Boulangrin. And it's a modernist building in the middle of the city that everybody hates. Everybody hates because Reims was um, um, a very bourgeois uh, city in France and it was all destroyed by the war, and then suddenly they have to rebuild a lot of things, and they have to rebuild a lot of modern building. And Les Halles Boulangrin was have a modern uh, scul uh, structure. It was steel and, uh, and, uh, and, um, and bricks, and for, for them it was really an ugly thing. And slowly to slowly, the, the building start to be not renovated at all, and it started to be destroyed more and more. And finally, at that moment, in 2010, uh, they, uh, it started to be so destroyed that they have to um, restore it totally. Unfortunately, they classify the, uh, the building as a monument, so they cannot destroy it anymore, but they have to rebuild it in a way. So we took, I, I found it logical to found the stone um, from that building. So it was actually uh, old bricks. So I, I, I took the bricks and I engraved them like a, like a classical sculpture with a hammer and, a <laughs> and, uh, and I did this uh, to look like stones, to make it look like real stones. And, um, but also the, the materiality of, the, of, of these bricks is really nice because it's between the yellow and the pink, so it's really close to the, to the color of the skin. So for, for a sensitive way, it was, it was interesting. And, um, Which is, again, 
<clears throat> again, something that has been neglected, like for example, this building has mm -hmm. been neglected for decades and mm -hmm. considered either ugly yeah. or inappropriate. And in the middle of the city. Yeah. It's not like in the suburb, it's really in the middle, near the cathedral. Mm -hmm. And then like history will change, and mm -hmm. now like it's a monument that is mm -hmm. considered to be protected. Mm -hmm. So it is again another image of how things they move in time and space and mm -hmm. how meanings they change. Mm -hmm how the value changes mm -hmm. and uh, it's about the perspective and how the things they, they get transformed, mm -hmm. which also like happen many times in your work. You either take something neglected and turn it into something like beautiful or take something that has been considered even inappropriate as a gesture, like mm -hmm. for example, the idea of staining walls or staining the floor and turn it into poetical. That's why, for example, yesterday we were visiting the show and I found really beautiful as a curatorial gesture to have your room next to the Yam Vo installation because I also think that Yam Vo works in a way by turning these neglected symbols of culture and history into new narratives that open new possibilities for future interpretation. And he also, like, for example, in this case, he worked by revealing what is behind the plaster walls. And in this beautiful historical building, like, to see, like, what is behind is a really, like, beautiful, poetical, radical, aesthetic gesture, which is, again, by no chance has to do with destruction in a way. <clears throat> and so this, for example, uh, again, is a work that um, has this image of something that is collapsing. Uh, this is like um, a, a beautiful work which is called The Deposition, as the famous painting from late Renaissance, but you have this um, theatrical backdrop with uh, clouds. Um, and again, we have this image of like performativity in a way, theater, stage, that again has been emptied and turned into like a sort of a ghostly place. And if I'm not wrong, this was the first time they used like the image of the clouds, like um, which bring us to the, um, the show that is currently on view at the Pompidou. So, Latifa has been awarded, as many of you will know, like uh, has been awarded of the uh, Prix Marcel Duchamp last year, and the consequence of this really prestigious French prize for um, uh, an emerging artist is like to have a show at the Pompidou, which um, I hope that many of you will have the chance to see that because it's really beautiful work. And uh, can I walk through the show like the so like you enter this room and you see like this kind of like um, uh, the black clouds that are really, really almost touching the, um, the floor. And if I understand well, like these clouds are kind of ready made so that are used in theater when they want to have the clouds on the stage, they, they, they rent or buy or fabric this uh, make this these clouds and then you walk through the through the through the room which is a long rectangular and you start looking at these clouds and you see um, objects standing next to these clouds and all these objects um, they have like uh, either they've been immersed in uh, in black ink or like in this case, for example, this perfume gives the title to the exhibition L'Art du Thème and has this black ink inside. Or for example, this suitcase has been almost completely uh, kind of painted with, uh, with black ink. And then like the more you go, but then when you turn around the objects, then you see the clouds. So like you go on and you go on, you visit the whole installation, and when you're finally at the end of it, you don't see any more the back of them, you don't see any more the objects that has been um, kind of poisoned with the black ink, but you see this beautiful landscape of clouds. So 
I can say many things about this work because I think that it was a really emotional experience for me to visit it. Uh, but I would like you to say before something about this work and then I will add something because I really think that is a fantastic installation and most probably one of the most complex work that you have made until now. Um, <clears throat> so to speak again about my childhood, <laughs> And um, I tried to, for, for this exhibition, it was important for me to give something um, of myself. Uh, and I tried to remember what was the most um, important object I met in my life. So it's in this exhibition, you have all these kind of object. You have a suitcase, you have um, a lamp, made with a, a ceramic representing a shell. You have a petanque uh, boil. You have a, um, a red string, uh, uh, plastic flowers, like a lot of things that I, uh, that even if we cannot uh, realize the importance of the object, it's really a simple object that you can easily recognize. and. Um, so I deposit <laughs> in the floor of the uh, museum all this object. And before that, I, I, I put all the object in a big um, container of ink. And, um, and I let it dry. And then I bring it to the, to the, to the exhibition space. And, um, um, so the, the, maybe the, the thing that I can tell you is um, when I said that uh, I can change everything uh, before a show, here it was a little more complex because we have to set everything several months before the opening. So it was a little bit frustrating for me. But um, so I know where will be the cloud approximately. And the object I didn't know so for me, it was my percentage of freedom was regarding the object. So until the last moment, I didn't know about which object will arrive and uh, where it will be exactly in the space. So it, it was my part of freedom for the installation. And I really thought in the beginning that the object will be in the light side of the cloud. And finally, when I was in the space, I found it completely unlogical and it was more simple to put it in the black side so it, it, it was really working much much more yeah, it was evident in a way and um, uh, for me it's it's really maybe too much fresh this ex exhibition to speak about because it's uh, it's a lot about uh, my own memory it's uh, very I think uh, emotional for me and in the other end, I am too much in a technical aspect of the exhibition to describe it, but I can go for a very technical aspect of the exhibition. But and for um, me, for example, hmm. um, we don't know anything about the history yeah. of these objects. Hmm. And so it's true, we understand it's true, like the press release says that they belong to your history. <clears throat> Sorry, but like um, I also think that each of us can connect to them because, for mm -hmm. example, each of us has memories of uh, preparing a suitcase, mm -hmm. either for moving from one mm -hmm. flat to the other, or leaving mm -hmm. a, a country, or leaving a city, leaving a partner. So, like we can all connect to to them, which is, I think, one of the what strikes me in your work many of them, of the images, of the symbols that you use, they belong to your own personal history, but then they become much more universal and, um, and much more about, you know, the experience that each of us can have. But for me, like, the work is really has to do with the idea of acceptance, because you have this really kind of black landscape when you enter the room, and then you start walking and realizing that, as happens in life, I mean, bad things, you can just ha be happy when you finally learn how to accept them and not just even just leave them behind you, but
but um, becoming another person because, like, I mean, you started accepting them. So it is, of course, I mean, a work that has to do with the past and the future. You said, like, many times that your work has to do with the idea of a possibility, something that has been destroyed, uh, that is a ruin of the past, that it becomes like an image of the future. So, like, um, your work is more about what it could be than what it was. Yes, and in the same time, it's um, erasing the past. When you are in the in the in the side, when you see only the the clear cloud, you have no n nothing related to the past. So it's but it's theater, huh? <laughs> and the and the and the artwork is not reality. So we are always uh, playing uh, things in a way, and we are um, professional of playing things with with objects. And, and it, it's, it's true that the, the feeling I get when I was, finally we finish all the installation because I didn't saw it before. <laughs> so, okay, I did a test with five cloud, uh, three months before the installation. So uh, I, I know a little how it will be, but I have no idea about how it will be in the entire, entire room. And um, it was really a feeling of, uh, of um, release. yeah, release, freshness, something that are like very joyful in a way. And uh, on the in the other end, it was uh, <laughs> It was suspect. It was I was completely suspicious about the fact the fact to be so joyful and lighter after um, after this um, after walking in this landscape. But I think that it, it's, I mean, it's really beautiful. And I, what I like is that the fact that it may even look like a, kind of so simple. But for example, I spent a lot of time in the show. And I, so I started looking at people. And you see people entering the space, looking with a little bit of what it is now. Like, I mean, they look at these objects. They look at the back of the clouds. And then the more they go on and they go on, but when they finally are at the end of the room and they are in front of this like sky with the, with the clear, uh, with the blue clouds, they start taking pictures and they look really happy. So like, I think it will be like uh, the most Instagrammed work in the last few months. But the, it's like, it's something that I think um, even now that we see like people that really like desperately taking pictures, I think that this relationship with the work is meaningful for the understanding of the work, like how we connect with the works through these like instant memories. And I have seen really like people beginning the show with a feeling and leaving the show with another feeling, which I think it's like a, a gift that an artist uh, when he's or she's capable to give to the audience is a great gift. Like that you enter a room with a feeling and you leave it with another feeling, mm -hmm. which is completely is being transformed. Okay. So in my childhood again, <laughs> <laughs> my, my father used to work in a place called um, um, Casino Grand Cercle in Aix-les-Bains. And... Um, um, several times per month, there were some um, um, performance of opera, operette. We call it operette. It's like small opera with uh, characters, costume, and and, uh, and stuff. And um, and uh, so I was my 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 father always bring me to to see this uh, spectacle. Uh, and. Uh, but the, the thing that I, I had the chance to to do is to to go to the to the scene after the the show, and uh, and it was really a very nice moment for me because I saw everything with the light on, and uh, and it was a it was an interesting feeling to see all the costume the object that looked so beautiful when I was in the in the audience, and now everything looks so fake <laughs> and uh, badly done, just fixed with a few glue or some scotch, and uh, 
but you don't see that when you are in the other side. And um, I, I really like that. I, I, I remember, but I only remember that thing when I was installing the show. I remember that, oh yes, this is a feeling I know, like yes. to when you turn on the light and everything is uh, finished, but suddenly it's open to something to another materiality of the of the of, of the of the things, mm. and uh, so in in this insta installation I start with the end, and I I it was a, in a way a reverse of this uh, memory of this feeling. Mm. Um, well, now I would like to invite the audience if any of you has any question or. Anything to ask to Latifa? Perhaps I missed it, but uh, I have a question about the title Eratum and also about this installation. Uh, how do you imagine to do this installation in another place? Would that mean that you uh, will do the same process, or will you just install what we have, what is the result? <coughs> Alors, Eratum is really interesting because when I do that, uh, um, every time I show it the first time, sometimes I show it a second time. So it's depend of the of the work. When I show it show it the first time, I have to go. I have to find some glasses. So I go to some shops. It depends of where. Um, so I, I know several areas in uh, Marseille, in Paris, in New York. Uh, in uh, some time, I just uh, took it in Paris, in some neighborhood, and then I ship it to the place. And uh, it depends of the year. It depends of the season, but the color change. Uh, Sometimes you have more glasses from India or from Korea, and then you have different kind of colors. And uh, sometimes you have more silver, you have more gold, sometimes you have some violet. So it's, it's like if I work with a, with a palette of uh, colors that is depending of the, of the season. So yeah, yeah, it's like <laughs> impressionist. And, um, and uh, it's, um, so it's in, it's in style. So then for each work you have, um, for example, that one, it was in 2009. I had some uh, masters, like in video, you have the masters or in sound of the glass. And I've got a, a large stock of glass and I know exactly the color that have to be used to redo this work, exactly. And, um, um, I think that one was the one that was shown in PS1 uh, last, last year or two years ago. So it was this work uh, with um, uh, extra glass from this exact glass that I, I ship it after to do the same colors, <laughs> like to have the same colors on the same kind of, of glass. process of destruction belongs doesn't belong always to the work so uh, sometimes you just use what you what you had already destructed yes and I have 20% um, more to destroy it on site okay. and it's about this 20% more that I have that I bought in in extra or that I have in in storage mm -hmm. because I, I, I like to yeah it's very technical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the question is, did you ship with the treaties? Yes. So, like, uh, the, the work exists yes. now in the form of the scroll? Yeah. And then you may add the new, like, Exactly. Okay. If, yeah. I so, I have an amount of destroyed glass, and I have an amount of new glasses, and I always have the masters that make me... It's like to remade... Uh, I don't know how... Um, yeah, but... Uh, 
like a, a big part is still destroyed on site. Mm. And uh, some words about the title. Uh, the title <laughs> come from yeah, it's it's uh, it, it was log logical for me at that moment because it was um, um, it's funny because. I first started with the work of Richard Serra that is not splashing lead, but it was the one with the end catching lead. And, uh, so it's really the, the, really the beginning. <laughs> it's a video work. So my plan in the beginning was to make a video with my hand <laughs> uh, uh, breaking a glass. So by error. It was like the mistake of breaking a glass by, by error. So I refer myself to this work of, of uh, Richard Serra. And, and then, so I went to a space, I bought a group of glass, and I did that. But it doesn't break in the wall, uh, in the floor. So, <laughs> so it was really funny because to have the glass uh, broken, I really have to throw it. So suddenly it wasn't a mistake anymore, it was uh, a real, uh, yeah, it was an intentional gesture. And uh, so, yeah, and then I experimented like that, and it's uh, finally, it wasn't easy to break in the floor directly, the most easy was to break it in, in, in the corner of the wall. So I had one glass broke in the corner of the wall, and uh, and then I go on, and I break a line <coughs> of glass, and then I wanted to, to fill out all the room with that, all a complete wall with that. So it's ended with a, with a more splashing lead than, yeah, than a end catching lead. <laughs> mm. So the, the error come from this, uh, um, the first uh, thing I wanted to do, and maybe the error was to think that it will be easy. <laughs> okay, I'm just curious about the, um, your creative process between material and concept. Because before you said like uh, with the carbon paper, you kind of choose the material first, and then you start to, what, what are you going to do about it? So, because usually, like, you have a concept, and then you're going to, you're going to choose the material. So, I'm just curious about your creative process between material and concept. For me, it's always a material first, never concept first, because I'm not... Uh, Maybe I'm not enough cerebral. <laughs> no, I don't know. Oh, but uh, it's always a material first because, um, um, yeah, I'm not a philosopher. I, I am a materialistic artist. So my, uh, for me, it starts. I don't know. I, okay, I thought about that when I was a student and I wanted to make like conceptual art and I, but then how you can start with an idea and then end it with a, with a sculpture, it's always, uh, for me it was more um, logical and more simple to, to reverse this, uh, this first impression I had about what, what it's to me to do an artwork because it's, it's always a material first. Also because I think that your work has to do with the idea that materials and objects, they have a history, they tell a story. So if you let them speak, and then you do like gestures with them, like uh, I think that it makes sense, this, because like uh, it's true that you choose a material, but like uh, then it starts speaking to you about like numbers of experiences, uh, and that what they can mean today when those experiences are maybe over. So th it is about also the history of things and what they deliver in terms of messages or ideologies or. Uh, hello. Uh, <laughs> could you uh, tell us something about the other work you have at Palazzo Grassi, Fantôme Jasmin? Um, 
So it starts first with a experience, <laughs> concrete experience with material. <laughs> so um, I was in Beirut um, preparing uh, an exhibition there, a group exhibition. And uh, I was in a, in a car with a friend who were talking about things and suddenly a guy arrived to sell us some jasmine and he had uh, a piece of wood with all this um, um, uh, uh, string of jasmine on it and on, his, uh, on a shirt above it. And I, I, I found it so beautiful, like because it was, he tried to protect it from the pollution or from the, uh, the, the dust or everything. And, uh, and when I came back from this trip, it was several months after the um, revolution of Jasmine in, in, in Egypt. And, and um, so I thought that I cannot make a work about that because it's too clear. <laughs> it's too directly involved in uh, the... the the actuality, and uh, but in the other end, it was. I really thought that it was really uh, um, touching my the feeling I get about uh, this revolution in Egypt, and uh, that uh, jasmine, like all flower, will uh, end it to be dry and. Uh, lose all the colors and the smell and everything, and uh, and it's it's exactly <laughs> what was my feeling about uh, the um, the demonstration of the people in uh, in this uh, area, uh, like uh, like uh, several uh, um, like all the revolution and especially in France uh, after the revolution you have a, a period of uh, terror, so. The people demonstrate, and then they start to cut heads of everybody. <laughs> and uh, I, when I, when the revolution happened in Egypt and Tunisia and all all that part of the world, I thought I was really afraid about what will happen after. So it's it was something about to deal with this uh, idea, and that's why I. I I assume to to do this uh, to do this work, yeah. and um, the technical thing is uh, the high of the wood is uh, one meter forty, and according to Le Corbusier, is the size of the. Okay, so it's, so it's just a little. <laughs> Non ci sono altre domande, io ringrazio ancora una volta Latifa Eshax e Alessandro Rabottini e voi Thank per you, essere Alessandro. stati qui con noi questa sera. Prima di salutarvi però vi vorrei invitare a prendere all'ingresso i flyer con le nostre prossime attività e in particolare questo venerdì il 31 dalle 10 alle 18 proiettiamo ogni ora dei documentari incentrati sulla figura di grandi storici dell'arte internazionali e che hanno svolto una ricerca fondamentale per la disciplina e tre di loro, eh, Michel Tevo, Gilles Tibergien e Victor Stoicita saranno con noi qui alle 18, sempre lo stesso giorno per una tavola rotonda introdotti dai produttori di questa serie e al termine c'è anche un momento di convivialità perché ci sarà un cocktail nel teatrino quindi ci farebbe piacere rivedervi di nuovo grazie e buona serata